Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm gonna get started. Welcome to the session on exercise biochemistry and aging and neuromuscular disorders. My name is Vladimir Lubacic. I'm from McMaster University. Uh, I'm the chair of this session. I'm really thrilled and honored to be uh, chairing this session this morning. I want to thank the IBEC organizing committee, the local organizing committee in particular for putting on this outstanding meeting, giving us the opportunity to get together in person, discuss our data, discuss our stories, um, and thanks Dave, he's not in the room at the moment, but thank you David for the invitation and for programming the session this morning. I'll be the first speaker this morning, and then I'll be followed by my colleague at McMaster, Dr. Mark Tonopolsky, who will be talking about exercise biochemistry and mitochondrial myopathy patients. And then Dr. Beth Phillips from the University of Nottingham will present on the molecular mechanisms of exercise in octogenarian participants. And then our final speaker of the session will be from the University of Ottawa, Dr. Emmerich raval who will be talking about myotonic dystrophy type one and exercise. So I'll be discussing uh, a single dose of exercise as molecular medicine for neuromuscular disorders and the disorders that we're interested in our laboratory are Duchenne muscular dystrophy, myotonic dystrophy type one, and spinal muscular atrophy, which collectively are the most prevalent neuromuscular diseases in children and adults. Uh, and today I'll be presenting unpublished data uh, on a story that we have about myotonic dystrophy, the impact of a single bite of exercise with a focus on mitochondrial dynamics and mitophagy. So I want to begin by acknowledging the folks in the lab that actually did the work, that collected the data, a PhD student uh, in our group, Andrew McCall, as well as a former grad student and current neurology resident here in the city, uh, Dr. Alex Manta, Sean Ng, a senior PhD uh, in our group, and an incoming master's student uh, in the fall, Aizen Law Osborne, who contributed to this project as part of her undergraduate thesis. And of course, uh, we're grateful to the funding agencies that, that helped make our work possible. So I'll begin with a very brief uh, background on DM1. Uh, I'll also talk again very briefly about exercise biology in DM1. I'll note a few uh, recent uh, preclinical studies in this area as well as a, as a very recent um, study in patients. Then I'll talk about uh, the unpublished data that we have looking at mitochondrial quality control in DM1 muscle as well as mitochondrial mechanisms revealed by a single dose of exercise in the skeletal muscle of a preclinical mouse model, DM1, uh, with an emphasis on mitochondrial dynamics and mitophagy. And then I'll summarize it, I'll try to keep it moving. Uh, I'm looking for 20 minutes and change so I can give some time back to our next speaker. So uh, myotonic dystrophy type one or DM1 is a, uh, it's a multi-systemic condition that's best characterized arguably by muscle wasting, weakness and fatigue as well as myotonia, which is the inability of the muscle to relax after a contraction. It's the, it's the second most prevalent form of muscular dystrophy after Duchenne, and it is the most common muscular dystrophy in adults. It's caused by an autosomal dominant trinucleotide CTG microsatellite repeat expansion mutation right here in the three prime untranslated region of the dystrophia myotonica protein kinase gene, the DMPK gene. When it's transcribed, these mRNAs, they retain this uh, expanded CUG tract. Uh, and these expanded CUGs, they form very stable secondary and tertiary structures, which facilitate the, the very tight winding and accumulation of these transcripts. Uh, and they become accumulated within uh, nuclei. They're not exported. And they form these RNA foci within nuclei. And it's there where they exhibit a toxic gain of function, whereby these RNA foci, they attract and sequester important RNA binding proteins and splicing factors within nuclei, in particular one called muscle blind or MBML, which I'll talk more about in my, uh, in my presentation. So there's a toxic gain of function in the CUG uh, repeats in the uh, DMPK mRNA that results in a loss of function in many of these factors. And, and this results in abnormal splicing of several mRNAs that impact muscle homeostasis. mRNAs for important proteins like the chloride channel, the insulin receptor, the dihydropyridine receptor, the ryanidine receptor, and Titan, just to name a few. Uh, 
Uh, and this leads to, and it's the misplacing of these transcripts which impacts the, the translation and, and the content of those proteins and the function which lead to the DM1 phenotype, which I noted on the previous slide. So DM1 can be, the pathology can be thought of as a pathology of RNA toxicity. It can be thought of as an RNAopathy uh, and a spliceopathy. And there's no cure for DM1. Uh, and I'm just throwing up this really busy slide here uh, just to, and this is from a recent review in 2018, just to emphasize that uh, over the years there, there have been several studies, excellent studies, looking at the impact of exercise in patients, in DM1 patients, investigating the safety and efficacy of exercise. And many, many of these studies have shown several beneficial clinical functional adaptations in patients. But what's unknown, however, not well characterized, are the molecular mechanisms that underlie these beneficial adaptations. So a few years ago, uh, Emmerich and colleagues in Bernard Jasmine's laboratory demonstrated that chronic physical activity could reduce the spliceopathy in the skeletal muscle of a preclinical mouse model, DM1, the HSA-LR model, the most commonly used mouse model. And we showed similar results uh, in our paper. Uh, in addition, we also demonstrated that chronic exercise could reduce markers of the RNAopathy, could reduce the accumulation of these expanded toxic uh, RNA species uh, could reduce the uh, myonuclear foci, uh, decrease the amount of muscle blind protein that's uh, sequestered within the, uh, the nuclei and, and liberate those factors to, uh, so that they can perform their various functions within the cell. And coincidentally, we saw a, an improvement in myotonia in these animals. And, and we did this work in collaboration with Jane Kalmar's group and Tom Hawk's group. So these were the, the first studies to show that exercise training could improve molecular disease outcomes in DM1 skeletal muscle, at least in the preclinical context. And then very recently, uh, in work led by Andrew and Mark and Mark's team, we demonstrated that indeed a, a aerobic exercise training could elicit several uh, favorable clinical outcomes in a cohort of DM1 patients. And this occurred largely independently of changes in DM1 specific pathophysiological mechanisms. So, uh, the uh, markers of the RNAopathy, markers of the spliceopathy were largely unaffected. But what was really interesting that Andrew found was that there was a mitochondrial phenotype in the skeletal muscle of these patients that was improved with aerobic training. So what we're trying to do now is extend these findings to rever reverse translate these data back into the preclinical context and investigate the impact of a single dose of exercise or a single bout of exercise on uh, mitochondrial mechanisms, the mitochondrial phenotype, mitochondrial biology uh, in the skeletal muscle of uh, these DM1 animals with a, with a specific focus on mitochondrial dynamics and mitochondrial turnover. We were really fortunate uh, yesterday to hear from the experts on, on these topics. So I'm gonna, keep, I'm gonna keep this very brief. This is a really nice, uh, simple summary uh, from a recent paper from Chagospoulos group uh, summarizing the dynamics, mitochondrial dy dynamics, which is the balance between uh, the fusion and fission of discrete organelles into larger reticular structures and vice versa. And on the fusion side, there's proteins like uh, M uh, OPA1 and MFN1 and MFN2 that regulate this process. And on the fission side, we've got DRP1, FIS1, and several other molecules which regulate uh, the fission of, of, the, uh, of the reticulum. Uh, mitochondrial uh, turnover is the balance between biogenesis and mitophagy. And this is, again, another really nice diagram from a recent review uh, from Dave Hood's group. And mitophagy is the uh, recycling and removal process for damaged and dysfunctional organelles. And this process is controlled by, by several uh, adapter and regulatory proteins like uh, PINK and PARKIN and, and uh, BNIP. And we have the marking of dysfunctional and damaged organelles by ubiquitin, the envelopment of these mitochondria in the autophagosome, the fusion to the lysosome. And these processes are, are governed by a master regulator of uh, mitophagy, autophagy, the transcription factor, TFEP. So we, what we wanted to do first was, was characterize the expression level of these regulatory proteins for fission fusion and mitophagy in the skeletal muscle of of healthy wild-type animals and in the muscle of this preclinical model of DM1, HSA-LR mice. So we use Western blotting to do this. You can see the blots over here on the left. Some examples from wild-type muscle and a couple examples from uh, the DM1 animals and all the proteins that we measured over here. 
just draw your attention to uh, some of the markers of mitochondrial fission. We found that the, uh, the pro-fission mark on DRP1, the phosphoserine 616, as well as total DRP1 levels were expressed to a higher extent in the DM1 condition, uh, DM1 condition excuse me, relative to wild type. And over here, markers of metophagy, including TFEB, BNIP, Parkin, and ubiquitin uh, upregulated in the uh, DM1 muscle compared to wild type. So an imbalance in some of the factors that control fission and mitophagy and DM1 muscle per potentially as a compensatory adaptation to remove damage and break down and remove damage and dysfunctional organelles. So next, we uh, separate, separated all of our animals into additional groups. We had wild-type animals that were sedentary, wild-type animals that were run uh, a single dose of exercise or a single bout of exercise in road and treadmill. This is a graded exercise protocol until the inability to continue exercise was objectively determined. We took the tissues immediately after exercise, zero hours or three hours post. And uh, in the DM1 animals, we had similarly a sedentary group. We had animals that ran, and then we took their tissues at zero uh, 3, 12, and 24 hours during the recovery time course. Over here in the middle, as expected, the DM1 mice ran significantly less than their wild type counterparts, whether we look at mean maximal distance uh, right here or a survival curve for distance over here on the right. So after this experiment, we wanted to uh, investigate whether canonical exercise-induced signaling was uh, preserved in the skeletal muscle of these DM1 animals. And so we looked at AMPK activation status as well as pg one alpha mRNA. So for the former, we used Western blotting. Again, here's the, the phosphothurinine-172 mark on AMPK, uh, the total AMPK. In the wild-type animals, the sedentary group, zero three-hour groups, and then in the D1 mice, zero, uh, excuse me, zero uh, <laughs> sedentary, zero, three, 12, and 24-hour groups. The phospho and the total. The data is graphically summarized over here on the right in this line graph, and this is AMPK activation status, which is the ratio of the phosphorylated formula to the total. We see a very rapid and transient increase in AMPK activation in the wild-type animals uh, immediately after exercise. We also observe that response in the dystrophic animals. And to the right of the line graph is a bar graph showing the maximal magnitude and direction of change elicited by this single bout of exercise. So in this example, AMPK activation status was similarly increased. The magnitude of the increase was similar between genotypes. Uh, down here uh, on, uh, on the left, this is uh, pgc one alpha mRNA expression. Uh, we see in both the wild type group and the DM1 group at three hours post-exercise. So this uh, lagged a little bit behind what was happening with AMPK kinase. Significant increases in pgc one alpha mRNA expression, and the magnitude of the increase was similar, again, between genotypes. Keep in mind, always, when we're talking about DM1, this is a a condition that affects splicing, it's a spliceopathy. So we wanted to look at the splicing function of pg one alpha which is a more recently defined, uh, described phenomenon of this, of this protein. So we looked at the alternative splicing of this pg one alpha target, NDR, uh, NDGR4, shown, excuse me, shown here, shown right here. Uh, in response to exercise in the wild type animals, there was a strong tendency for an increase uh, three hours post, uh, and, and uh, in contrast, in the DM1 animals, immediately after exercise, and that was maintained at least for 24 hours post-exercise. Uh, so some uh, canonical and novel exercise-induced signaling uh, in the muscle of, uh, of these DM1 animals. Uh, next, we wanted to see if this uh, exercise response was associated with any changes in, in DM1-specific pathophysiological mechanisms. And so to do that, we looked at markers of the arneopathy and the spliceopathy. And so for the former, we use fluorescence in situ hybridization to identify the toxic CUG expansions, the, the uh, extended uh, CUG parts of the mRNAs. And you can see here in this panel, hopefully you can see uh, the arrows are pointing to a puncta of CUG expanded mRNAs. And this is a, in a, a muscle cross section uh, from a, a, a DM1 animal under sedentary conditions quite a contrast between the, uh, the wild-type animal under, sed under sedentary conditions uh, shown up here. And then we have a higher magnification uh, at the bottom. This is an example of one of those RNA foci. We use immunofluorescence labeling to look at uh, muscle-blind protein localization within the fiber. Uh, in the sedentary uh, control animals, we see a, a wide distribution of the protein as expected. It has functions in the cytosol, it has functions in mononuclei, so it's free to do what it needs to do. 
In a DM1 sedentary animals, the arrows are indicating the, these accumulations of muscle blind proteins. And in the higher mag down below, we can see one of these examples, and it overlays very nicely with this, uh, with this single uh, RNA fo uh, foci uh, found within a single mononucleus. So this is an example of, of sequestered muscle blind protein caught within this web of CUG expanded mRNAs. And these data are all summarized down here on the left. This is uh, uh, CUG positive mononuclei. As expected in the DM1, DM1 animals, there's, it's a much higher level compared to the wild type shown down here. Interestingly, we saw a modest but statistically significant reduction in CUG positive mononuclei 12 and 24 hours after exercise in the DM1 animals. Now, in contrast to that, when we looked at the amount of muscle blind that was sequestered within mononuclei, we see no impact of exercise in the DM1 mice. So collectively, these data indicate that the exercise response was, was very modest in these, uh, in these animals. As a marker of the spliceopathy, we looked at the alternative splicing of the chloride channel. So we assessed the abundance of the chloride channel transcripts with exon 7A, which encodes the fetal isoform, less functional isoform of the protein that's rapidly degraded as well as the transcript uh, without exon 7A, which encodes the uh, fully functional mature form of the protein that's incorporated into the sarcolemma that participates in muscle relaxation after contraction. And the transcript that lacks exon 7A is smaller, so it migrates further in the gel. And the transcript with exon 7A is heavier, so it, it doesn't migrate uh, as far in the gel electrophoresis. All that to say that there was no impact, there was no effect of exercise on this marker of, uh, of splicing, of chloride channel alternative splicing. So um, while one bout of exercise is likely necessary, it's, it's clearly insufficient to uh, elicit uh, responses in, in DM1 specific pathophysiological mechanisms that are observed with repeated bouts of exercise in the same model that we and, and others have documented and I mentioned uh, previously. So one bout of exercise is not enough to affect these pathophysiological mechanisms. On the other hand, when we look at the mitochondrial story, and this is uh, first focusing on the, on the fission data, these are the, again, these are the proteins that we measured, the pro-efficient site on uh, DRP1, total DRP1 and FIS1. I'll just draw your attention to the data right here in the middle. This is the phosphorylated level of, of DRP1 increased in response to exercise, both in the wild type and the DM1 animals. Total DRP1 excuse me, total DRP1 was unaffected by exercise in, in both genotypes. And then when we look at the DRP1 activation status, which again is the ratio of the phosphorylated form relative to the total, shown down here, a significant increase in the wild type condition uh, at zero hours after exercise that's, that's maintained three hours post. And then we see a similar response in the DM1 condition. And the magnitude of the increase was the same between genotypes. Uh, on the fusion side, we looked at the inhibitory mark on DRP1, the phosphoserine uh, 637, as well as um, MFN2 and OPA1 levels. And uh, just to be consistent with the previous slide, we'll focus on the DRP1 data. Again, this is the inhibitory site, the, the uh, inhibitory site for fission, so it can be considered or interpreted as a profusion site on DRP1. Increased in response to exercise uh, three hours post, both in the wild type and DM1 conditions. Recall from the previous slide, there was no impact of exercise on total DRP1 levels. And so the uh, ratio of the phosphor relative to the total, which can be considered as a marker of inhibitory status rather than activation status, so my apologies for that confusion, uh, increased three hours post in the wild type animals and increased three hours post significantly in the DM1 mice, but the magnitude of the increase was significantly less in the DM1 condition compared to wild type, indicating an attenuation uh, although, you know, the presence of the, uh, these changes in markers of fusion combined with changes in markers of fission would suggest that a single bout of physical activity is, is initiating the identification and uh, recycling and removal of, uh, of mitochondria. Again, we're dealing with a, a spliceopathy, so we looked at the alternative splicing of OPA1 mRNA. In particular, we assess the uh, levels of OPA1 transcript with exon 4B and those without exon 4B. And this particular exon is important for maintaining mitochondrial DNA replication and transcription, as well as um, mitochondrial respiration. So critical fusion-independent functions of OPA1. 
So we use the splicing assay again to, to look at the abundance of the transcripts with and without exon 4B. The heavier transcript migrates uh, to a lesser degree compared to the lighter transcript without exon 4B, which migrates further in the gel. And we quantify the data using two different measures on the left. This is uh, OPA1 exon 4B inclusion relative to the total amount of OPA1 mRNA. And on the right, this is the total amount of exon 4B relative to gap DH. And regardless of which metric that, that we look at, we see a similar response, a strong tendency, or a significant increase in response to exercise. Uh, you can see here a strong increase in the wild type condition, a significant increase in response to a single dose of exercise uh, in the DM1 condition. And I'll just draw your attention to the fact that under basal sedentary conditions, the amount of exon 4B is significantly less in dystrophic muscle compared to wild type but uh, it's rescued, it's completely restored, it's completely normalized. So there's no difference between here and here, here and here in OPA, uh, OPA1 exon 4B uh, levels. So some potentially interesting uh, exercise-induced responses that could impact mitochondrial biology in the skeletal muscle of, um, of DM1 mice. And so finally, we, we used immunofluorescence labeling again to look at the myonuclear uh, localization, accumulation of that important transcription factor for metophagy, autophagy, TFEB. Uh, so we can, if we just look right over here, this is the condition, the wild type condition, zero hours post exercise. We look down at the bottom, we see an overlay between DAPI stained nuclei, and the arrows are indicating an accumulation of, uh, of TFEB within those nuclei. Uh, similarly, in the DM1 condition, immediately after exercise, the arrows are pointing to the co-staining of, of DAPI with, uh, with TFEB, indicating a, a translocation, possibly, of TFEB within the nuclei where, where it, uh, it can do its job. And the data is graphically summarized over here on the right. Strong tendency for an increase, zero hours post. In the wild type condition, an increase, zero hours post in the, in the DM1 condition. So uh, potentially, the the machinery for the removal and, and uh, recycling of dysfunctional damaged organelles is being upregulated in response to a single bout of exercise in, in dystrophic muscle. So to summarize, this morning I spoke about mitochondrial quality control processes uh, are unbalanced in the skeletal muscle of DM1 mice, in particular fission and mitophagy, which uh, are upregulated under the basal state, potentially as a compensatory response to get rid of damaged dysfunctional organelles. Acute exercise stimulates mitochondrial dynamics and turnover uh, in DM1 muscle to, to a lesser degree to some extent than what's observed in uh, the healthy condition, but nevertheless, it, it's, it gets turned on. One bout of exercise drives OPA1 mRNA alternative splicing and normalizes 4B levels. Uh, so this, this could be interesting. It's, um, it could be impactful for mitochondrial biology in, in a dystrophic condition. It's a relatively uncharacterized uh, uh, finding in our in our field, so we look forward to working on this a bit, bit more, and we're hoping others kind of do the same if, if they're interested. And my last point is a single dose of exercise uh, appears to be mitochondrial medicine in DM1 mice, and so one of the questions that comes from these uh, experiments is do these data translate back into the clinic for DM1 patients? We know that repeated bouts of physical activity in the form of aerobic training is beneficial clinically for these uh, for this cohort. What are the me molecular mechanisms that drive these adaptations uh, with respect to the mitochondrial phenotype, and there is a consist is there a consistency with what we're seeing um, in the preclinical context compared to what's happening in patients? So thank you everyone for your attendance and your attention. I think we have a couple minutes for questions if there are any before we move to our next speaker. Thank you. Hi, Vlad. Thank you. Really nice data. Um, I wanted to ask, of course, about um, TFEB and autophagy. So do you see lysosomal storage dysfunction in those mice? Because you did seem to have some aggregates. Have you looked at all at flux and lysosomal we, markers? Yeah, th thanks, Anna. That's a, a, a good question. We, um, we haven't, we weren't able to process the, the tissues to answer that question from this study. So uh, beyond, we don't have much beyond the regulators, steady state regulators of mitophagy and at this point, uh, we would need to see some some nice imaging data from uh, from those muscles to be able to answer that question. You had a really impressive, huge upregulation in TFEB, which could mean a block and flux or some lysosomal dysfunction. Yeah, thank you. That, that's a that's an excellent point. We, we hope to continue these studies and, and answer those that question and others using uh, different approaches.
which is thanks. And the clinical answer to that too is that we don't see lysosomal storage accumulation in myotonic dystrophy patients. So it doesn't look like Pompe disease, for example. So if you use acid phosphatase staining, uh, you see punctate in, uh, in Pompe, but you don't see that in myotonic. You see central nuclei, um, uh, increased uh, connective tissue, variation in fiber size, uh, but, uh, but not the, which is surprising. You'd think that there would be, yeah. I agree. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks very much for the invitation. I know some of you who were in the last session saying, what the hell is Tarnopolsky doing up here again? Um, the speaker who was supposed to be here, uh, Dr. Jepson, couldn't be here, so uh, David Hood uh, asked me to uh, give a talk, and uh, oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, my battery's gonna die, sorry. There we go. All right. So let me get this started. So I'm not the, sp I'm not the speaker you thought, uh, but I will be talking about the same topic. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about exercise and mitochondrial disease. And again, just because um, there is interest in muscular dystrophy, and I'm a clinician who sees patients as well as a scientist, I wanted to put in just a little bit about the benefits of exercise in patients. So you've seen my disclosures uh, previously. I won't uh, spend my time going through them, but I've been involved in a variety of trials uh, in muscular dystrophy patients, Pompe patients, et cetera. And I am the founder and CEO of Exerkine Corporation. And uh, we do have some uh, concepts about uh, developing uh, products for Pompe disease, muscular dystrophy, but uh, likely uh, with a no net profit uh, component to it. So what have I done for the last 35 years? I started off in kinesiology and uh, had a strong interest when I first started in physiologic adaptations. So over many years with my colleague Stu Phillips, uh, Marty Gabala, and others, uh, we studied the molecular mechanisms of adaptation uh, to uh, hypertrophy, or hypertrophic exercise, I should say. And also, uh, what's near and dear to my heart is endurance exercise and the mitochondrial biogenesis that occurs. And why I was interested in this is that when I finished neurology, at the time, it was a few years after the dystrophin gene was discovered, and people said within five years we're going to have a cure for these patients. Today, exon skipping is not a cure. My patients are really no different now than they were 35 years ago. Because of exercise and nutrition, we have had a very favorable impact and have added about 10 years lifespan extension to boys with this severe form of the disease. But we do not have a cure, and it's all come from exercise, which is really unfortunate because so many of the families said, ah, I don't believe in exercise, I don't believe in nutrition. It's not real medicine. It's not a druggable target. It's not a pill that I can take. And therefore, I'm gonna wait till that comes because it's gonna come very shortly. Still isn't here. Even for spinal muscular atrophy, I hasten to say, there's a small window of opportunity. And even there with newborn screening, which I uh, helped to get into Ontario, and I've treated now seven children, uh, two of them are on the verge of dying in spite of getting cured. Anyhow, with that, I've spent my whole life understanding what I've learned in exercise physiology to apply it to the patients that we see in the clinic, those with mitochondrial disease, which is my main area of specialty, and those with muscle dystrophy. And if you think about it, really muscular dystrophy here, it's the antithesis of hypertrophy, the atrophy that we see, as is mitochondrial dysfunction, is the antithesis of a top sport endurance athlete. And so over the years, we've been uh, more and more aware, and this uh, conference brings into sharp focus the fact that there's a variety of more common disorders for which there is secondary mitochondrial dysfunction. And we've taken advantage of that over the years because there wasn't a lot of funding to fund uh, mitochondrial uh, patient research, and we've uh, chosen aging as something that we've uh, studied, which has both aspects of atrophy and mitochondrial dysfunction. And I'm gonna focus mostly on mitochondrial disease, but I'm gonna show you that aging is the mitochondrial disease that we all have, and I'm gonna show you that all of the muscular dystrophies that we see, the big ones, uh, all have mitochondrial dysfunction, which is uh, partially reversible. 
So I'll very quickly go through this. I know everyone in the room knows uh, about this. We heard earlier about the endosymbiotic uh, uh, theory of the evolution of mitochondria 1.5 billion years ago, where we took on the mitochondria and have had this lovely uh, working relationship. During that time, uh, we've retained uh, 37, and you heard that uh, at least 38 with MOTC and maybe other um, uh, protein targets uh, and uh, nucleic acids are encoded for by the mitochondrial genome. What's interesting is that throughout evolution, the some 1,300 uh, um, uh, mRNAs that are required and proteins required to build uh, a mitochondria have now been taken up by the nuclear genome. But we still retain this circular uh, DNA vestige of the fact that this was likely a purple photosynthetic type of bacteria uh, uh, 1.5 uh, billion years ago. What's interesting is that if any two of you uh, were to sequence your mitochondrial genome, you could go back and be very accurately able to predict when you shared a common mom. And so really this was used by uh, Doug Wallace to trace the out of Africa hypothesis where we all uh, evolved as homo sapiens about 250 million years ago. And so the mitochondrial DNA comes from moms to all of their children. So guys, sorry, it's gonna die in your sperm and women are gonna be passing on the mitochondrial DNA. And that's why we can trace back and that's what they use to trace uh, human evolution. Uh, from a genetic uh, a metabolic perspective in the clinic, uh, there's the concepts such as uh, heteroplasmy and replicative segregation, which are important. And by that, we mean that in given tissues, you can have 1% of a mutant uh, mitochondrial genome or 100%. And generally, the uh, phenotypic uh, consequences are greater with higher mutant heteroplasmy, um, which um, won't get too much into. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about the mitochondrial genome is that, as you can see here, it's mostly a coding piece of nucleic acid. And as a consequence, if there's a mutagenic hit, such as ionizing radiation, you're more likely to hit a region that's coding for a protein or uh, one of the uh, tRNAs or uh, ribosomal RNAs, and you don't have the large uh, uh, areas of intronic um, um, uh, nucleic acid. And as a consequence, it's more prone to mutagenesis, but also the DNA repair mechanisms are a little bit um, less efficient than they are in the nuclear genome. So we've been interested in aging and sarcopenia because there's so many aspects of that that we see in our patients. And uh, older adults are a dime a dozen. Everyone here is aging. Um, but it's certainly something that we've been able to uh, study quite well. And we think mitochondria are really at the center or the heart of, uh, of aging. There are theories called inflammaging where people think that inflammation is the main issue. But I think, you know, and maybe I'm a mitocentric person, that the mitochondria are uh, important. So with mitochondrial dysfunction, pretty much every theory of aging you can tie back to the mitochondria. Uh, Dave Hood's done it, it, great work on uh, how mitochondrial dysfunction can cause apoptosis. There's strong links between mitochondrial dysfunction and telomere shortening. Uh, there have been uh, really interesting links uh, doing single fiber uh, microdissection techniques to show that mitochondrial dysfunction also can cause muscle atrophy, and that's been shown uh, well uh, in human aging. We know also that mitochondrial dysfunction can release danger associated molecular patterns, uh, free mitochondrial DNA, uh, which can activate NLRP3 associated caspase 1 activation of uh, various uh, uh, inflammasome uh, markers. And of course, oxidative stress, we've heard uh, great stuff, and I'm not going to get any more into that, but certainly that is one of the sources of uh, ROS. And when produced in excess, it can damage DNA, proteins, and lipids. So as a uh, clinician, um, my main area of specialty is mitochondrial disorders, and these usually refer to the disorders that uh, directly affect the respiratory chain. Uh, the first mutations were discovered many years ago, back in 1988, uh, as a point mutation uh, in 11778, which Doug Wallace described in Lieber Hereditary Optic Neuropathy, which is a devastating disease where teenage boys go blind rapidly with centrosecal visual loss, and they are blind for the rest of their life. Uh, we're working, uh, Josh uh, uh, Netterveen, who's one of my postdocs, has a, um, well, he was a postdoc, he's now a junior faculty. Uh, he has a Meadow Canada grant where we're trying to come up with a better nutraceutical cocktail uh, to try and recover uh, vision in the early stages of that disease. But anyhow, that's a mitochondrial DNA point mutation. And the other common one we see is called MILAS syndrome, which is an acronym for mitochondrial encephalomyopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes, which is one of the more devastating disorders that we see. We now know that there's more than 200 point mutations known in the mitochondrial genome associated with disease but an increasing number of nuclear genomic uh, defects, as one might expect, given that most of the mitochondria is built from the nuclear genome, uh, which cause neurologic disorders. And again, it, usually they end up in a neurology clinic because we have things like strokes, seizures, cognitive impairment, high-frequency sensory neural hearing loss, optic atrophy, retinitis pigmentosa. But for this crowd, skeletal muscle. 
So for many patients, because of the dysfunctional mitochondria, they take on a sedentary lifestyle, they uh, become more obese, and they also are exercise intolerant and tend to avoid exercise, but you'll see that paradoxically that's really what they do need. And again, I won't go through this, but uh, in the clinic uh, we see a variety of things which I mentioned, mostly related uh, to, uh, to the neurological system, uh, but of course cardiomyopathy can also be seen. And a paper from uh, my colleague Doug Wallace just came out looking at different animal models of mitochondrial disease and found that the cardiomyopathy was one that didn't seem to respond. But again, very artificial model, uh, certainly from a patient perspective, um, I don't think that that really holds true. Um, so what can we do to help these patients? So the first thing and the main thing that uh, you know, we've been doing now for 25, uh, 27 years in the clinic is what's called the mitochondrial cocktail. And what this is is to use uh, multiple nutraceuticals to try and target the final common pathways of mitochondrial dysfunction. So when we have, let's say, a mutation in uh, uh, complex one, uh, and then you know, we heard the beautiful talk by Daryl Neufer about the push-pull of electron flow, we can get increased uh, production of free radicals. So these ROS, uh, when present in excess, can damage the, uh, uh, the uh, protein and uh, DNA that we described uh, previously. We also have a reduction of aerobic ATP generation, and as a consequence, we flux through glycolysis, generate more lactate, uh, which is one of our biomarkers that we use, uh, but in addition, we churn through phosphocreatine, which was one of our earlier strategies is to try and replace phosphocreatine in these patients, which was somewhat successful. <clears throat> so we were one of the first to look at the mitochondrial cocktail in a more systematic fashion. Uh, this was a, a randomized uh, double-blind crossover trial, self-funded because the UMDF didn't fund me back then. Um, and uh, we had two-month RCT. People were on the supplement, which contained alpha-lipoic acid, coenzyme Q10, creatine monohydrate, and vitamin E. I won't go through the specific reasons why those were chosen, but there's very good reasons why we chose them. And uh, we were blinded, the patients were blinded, there was a washout period, and what we found in this study is that CoQ10 was absorbed and uh, was present in the plasma. 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine uh, was down, which is one of the markers of oxidative stress, as you all know. 8-isoprostanes and lactate were both lowered. Now again, we didn't do muscle biopsies, so we don't know for sure that there was an improvement in mitochondrial function, but at least the canonical markers reflective of mitochondrial dysfunction and reflective of the increase in ROS generation were favorably enhanced. One of the things that we've also been interested in is that given that our patients are living longer, and again, no new genetic therapy, no small molecules, the only disease for which there's an FDA and Health Canada approved therapy that's a muscular dystrophy is Pompe disease, which is enzyme replacement therapy costing $900,000 per patient per year, and keep that in the back of your head when we talk about it. But for various reasons, and I think it's mostly exercise, nutrition, and identifi identification of deficiencies, we're keeping people alive longer. And what we're seeing is we're seeing cardiovascular disease, we're seeing obesity, and as we see obesity, we're going to start to see fatty liver disease. And this is um, just a, a very small early representation of a study that we're now doing where we're doing DEXA scans on our patients because of crazy observations. One of the observations here, if you look here at mitochondrial disease, those are the folks here in the inverted triangles. Uh, we've had patients come in who appeared cachectic, they look skinny, and people would look at them and say, oh my God, you need more nutrition, you're super skinny. And by BMI criteria, of course, they were skinny. But when we do DEXA scan, they're obese. So what this is here in gray is this is the BMI cutoff and the obesity cutoff in percent body fat. And everything in gray is sarcopenic obesity. And what you can see is that curve should be linear, but it's shifted down towards sarcopenic obesity. So we're seeing that our patients are becoming more obese. And for some of you, you might not feel when you leave here today with your backpack going up a flight of stairs, the extra 20 or 30 pounds. But we've had boys with Duchenne dystrophy in one year from starting steroids who went from 11% body fat to 65% body fat. And that's pretty big impact on your functional capacity. So what can we do about this body fat? So uh, Josh uh, Netterveen has published a recent paper uh, in Nutrients uh, where we were looking for strategies to improve mitochondrial function and lower body fat but not lose muscle mass. So there's a variety of uh, experiments, and I won't go uh, through all of them, uh, where we use the high-fat fed uh, mouse model versus chow fed, and we did a very short 30-day uh, intervention after we had uh, um, got them uh, all obese for two months prior to that. And what we compared was exercise as our gold standard, uh, three times a week on the treadmill, 15 uh, meters per minute, 
And then we came up eventually after multiple combinations with our final uh, thing we call Trim 7, uh, which were some weight loss components, green tea extract, green coffee bean, and a mint extract called Forscolin, and a mitochondrial enhancer, which stemmed from our first clinical trial, which was this core we call it of ALA, CoQ10, and vitamin E. And given some really nice work on nitrates, we added some beetroot extract. This alone didn't work. This alone worked okay, but combining them together was our uh, greatest effect. So I presented this data in a, in a lab meeting, talking to one of my colleagues. His name is uh, Rick Austin, uh, who's a Canada Tier 1 professor at McMaster University. He was an expert in ER stress and fatty liver disease. And he said, Tarnopolsky, you're full of crap. There's no way this stuff is going to reverse fatty liver, uh, because that was the observation that we had. So we saw very similar things, is that with a controlled diet compared to high-fat diet, you all know you get a fatty liver. With the metabolic enhancer, that was almost completely reversed. And also, um, our um, complete pr protection, or almost complete protection, of the increase in body weight versus when we switched to the metabolic enhancer, Trim7, uh, they replicated that uh, blindly and independently. So this is the fat pad from a high fat fed um, uh, mouse, and this is uh, the animals that were on Trim7. What was interesting as well uh, in this study is that we didn't lose body fat. And some of you may be familiar with strategies to lose body fat, the most potent of which is bariatric surgery and, of course, GLP-1 receptor agonists. The issue is that both of those are associated with quite a dramatic loss of skeletal muscle mass, not the best thing for our patients. But from the fatty liver perspective, and I'd love to collaborate with Mark Fabreo on this, um, again, it's already been independently replicated, but I'd love to uh, do some more work on this, showing this is the oil red O stain uh, with high fat diet. This is exercise the gold standard. And you can see, just as Mark Fabreo had mentioned, and I don't know how on earth people can think that exercise is not an effective countermeasure for NAFLD or NASH. Uh, look at this. It's uh, essentially right back to control animals. Now, we weren't completely back to control. There's a few red specks here, but quite a substantial improvement in both histology and the amount of fat with this uh, Trim7. And we looked at the mechanism, and it appears to be mitochondrial biogenesis. So we have various uh, iterations of it, but bottom line is various browning markers are upregulated in um, the white adipose tissue. Um, Bruce Spiegelman's favorite molecule, PGC1-alpha, going up, uh, downstream effectors of that, as one might expect. CPT2, hormone-sensitive lipase, going up. And of course, inflammation going down. So we uh, are planning, um, starting later this year in our myotonic dystrophy patients, where every single one of the people that you just heard that Vlad mentioned in our study were all obese. Every one of them, all 11 of those individuals were obese. And uh, they did lose a bit of body fat with our exercise training study, but we're wondering if we can nest in uh, things that we've learned from Stu Phillips with the optimal protein, uh, creatine, and vitamin D with some of these other enhancers. So we've done a randomized uh, clinical trial, uh, 60 overweight and obese men and women, uh, three months of supplementation uh, with this. Primary endpoint, which you have to do for FDA, is weight loss. But of course, we're much, much more important, as I pointed out, in the body composition index, which is the re relationship between uh, lean mass and fat mass. And so uh, what we found here, this is placebo and trim seven. Uh, this is uh, hopefully going to be submitted next week. Josh, you're here next week, right? Good. So you can see these are the folks who are actually on Trim 7 versus um, placebo. I won't say who it is, but there was a grad student who uh, gained a little bit of weight, but he knew how to exercise and diet, and he was in the damn placebo group. So, you know, he was our biggest responder here. But in spite of that, the p-value was 0.0001 for our primary outcome. What was interesting, though, is that we've now looked at ALT, AST, and microRNAs involved in fatty liver disease, and they're all down about 25%. Uh, for this group compared to that group. So we're working with Liver Care uh, Ontario to do an RCT uh, in 100 people who have fatty liver disease. So now we're going to turn to the main uh, topic, and that's mitochondrial disease and, um, uh, and exercise intervention. So first, why do these patients have exercise intolerance? Well, I mean, I do this to a neurology group where they don't really understand it. I know everyone here gets it, and that is if your mitochondria don't work well, it can affect everything in the chain, right from cardiac pumping, gas transfusion, delivery, uptake, all the way down this chain into the mitochondria. And many of our patients have cramps with exercise. They can get rhabdomyolysis. And what's interesting is the average VO2 max in one of our first studies was 12 mils per kilogram per minute. 
Now, I've got to put that in context in another group, but you guys, I think, realize that that's a pretty substantial reduction. One lady's VO2 is 7 mils per kilogram per minute, and it's estimated from the aging literature that you need 12 mils per kilogram per minute for independent living. So you can see how impaired these patients are. And the question then is, if they're intolerant of exercise, if they avoid it, is it actually going to be a reasonable therapy for these individuals? So the first question is, can we do endurance exercise, and will this show any improvement? So first we turn to a mouse model, and it's called the Pole G uh, uh, Mutator Mouse Model. Um, uh, Tom Prola and Nils Larsen uh, created uh, similar mice, and you can see that by mutating here just one residue in the Pole G gene, uh, it completely eliminates the proofreading capacity. One accumulates mitochondrial mutations and it mimics human aging. And we and others have shown increased oxidative stress and inflammation and telomeres in these mice. So we thought that we would exercise them. And oh, look, it looks like we rescued progeroid aging. That's kind of interesting. Oh, what happened? It was retracted for blot duplication. And I need to thank someone in the audience, I won't say who it is, sincerely thank them for pointing this out. The blot duplication which occurred in this was unbelievable, and I'm going to mention it to all of you here so that you can look for these things. When blots in your supplemental files, especially when we read papers now, are flipped and inverted, it's kind of hard to find it. So I thank artificial intelligence, an individual here who pointed this out, and I believe it was another professor who found it. And we sincerely thank that individual and artificial intelligence. I also want to apologize for not finding the uh, insanity that this represents earlier. I was actually told during the investigation that this occurred in another paper. So it was a where's Waldo. I knew it was there. I spent hours, couldn't find it. So that's the degree of insanity from a certain individual. And it's completely antithetical to everything I stand for. And it's an insult to my patients. So I've had at least 50 kids with mitochondrial disease die. And it's a bloody insult that this individual did this. Um, and also, uh, I think it's an insult to all of the amazing, wonderful grad students who've worked in my lab, who I know have been amazing, honest, and uh, it really is an insult to them as well. But I think, you know, uh, this uh, quote uh, from Martin Luther King uh, really uh, summarizes everything. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. So what are my learning points from this? Well, first of all, I learned the university doesn't give a rat's arse about you, and many of the people that you thought were your friends will throw you under the bus and uh, probably dance on your grave. If anyone here thinks about cheating, always remember karma's come back to everybody. Nothing's more important than my true friends, many of whom are here, and my family. And the other point, too, which the Associate Dean of uh, Science, who is the only person at McMaster who really supported me, other than my colleagues, but I'm talking about the upper individuals, no matter what you do as a supervisor, a true con person, can still manipulate things and still get things through. So do all of the appropriate things, which we've now done in the lab, but just be, uh, be, be aware that this still can happen. Um, and again, if data is some, uh, somewhat too good to be true, it probably is. And uh, again, in the uh, spirit of the Third World War threats from the Cold War, trust but verify. And then I'll just finish this section. My sister is a philosopher, and uh, she wrote this book, and it's about Plato and the politics of shame. So the older people in the audience will give you that. For the younger people in the audience, I think people need to remember shame. And that's where I hope these in, or this individual uh, eventually ends up. Now, I, I'm not allowed to say, obviously, who this individual is. I just want to point out that my wife, because it was all males on that except for one female, and so I'm using a gender-neutral tone when I'm talking about this, but I will, at the risk of uh, getting my wrist slapped from the university, say that it was not my wife. She is a pathologist, and she independently wasted her time reviewing that data. So let's turn to the fun stuff. Now, what's interesting, and what really is a crime with this whole thing, is it's almost certainly real. We've actually, with um, uh, one of my uh, other um, uh, animal technicians, have reproduced aspects of this um, in, in the animal model, but it's been reproduced by others. So this was voluntary exercise, and I'm sure everyone in the audience recognizes David Sinclair, highly reputable laboratory, with voluntary exercise, which we don't find is as uh, potent. But you can see the body condition is very abnormal in these animals and is almost back to, uh, to square one. 
So that was similar to what uh, this individual reported in our paper. And there's a variety of metrics, too, showing that exercise is still a benefit. So part of me says, this is fantastic, and this is really what I care about, is the truth is that exercise does work for these animals. But who cares about animals? I'm a clinician, and you know I do basic science stuff, too, but I want to see what happens to patients. And so let's take a look at endurance exercise. So we know that the low VO2 is a hallmark of mitochondrial disease. What's interesting is that it becomes a vicious cycle. So uh, I think uh, Stu Phillips was talking about this. We did a study with Arkan Abadi, who was one of my postdocs. We put a leg immobilizer on the leg, and within two days, there was a 70% drop in PGC1 alpha. By the end of 14 days, there was a 25% drop in mitochondrial protein abundance. And so that becomes a vicious cycle. Exercise we know can increase uh, electron transport chain enzyme activity uh, in uh, healthy people and increase VO2, uh, but we just don't know if this would uh, do anything for patients. So the person who was supposed to give the talk uh, has published a very nice study, and I think it's one of the seminal studies uh, in training patients. And uh, this was 20 patients uh, with mitochondrial disease, uh, 14 had point mutations, the other ones had deletions. Uh, more of a CPO phenotype versus controls. They trained uh, 12 weeks at 70% of VO2 peak four times per week. They had an increase in citrate synthase and importantly, an increase in VO2 peak. And it was very similar between the two groups. So this is interesting because when we look at muscle biopsies from our patient, they have massive increase compensatorily in uh, mitochondrial uh, enzymes uh, depicted by the ragged red fiber. So this you know, not, doesn't necessarily translate to VO2 peak, but I was very pleased that it did. And that's quite a dramatic improvement. Taking someone from a 12 up to a 17 can have a huge impact on their life. Importantly, it was the first study to show that there was no damage to muscle, at least reflected by CK uh, or morphology. And then my good friend and colleague, Tanya Tabasalo, uh, who's done most of the work in the area of exercise uh, and training. Um, unfortunately, she uh, couldn't come and join us. Uh, she studied uh, patients with mitochondrial deletions. This is the CPO group, similar sort of a program, 14 weeks of cycle training. And then she looked at the deconditioning, because unfortunately, in the study that Vlad just mentioned about myotonic dystrophy patients, uh, almost every one of them after we stopped, stopped training, which is really a bugger. So I think what we need to do is find ways to you know, get them to continue. But what she found was an increase in submaximal work rate, improvement in oxygen extraction. So the AVO2 difference, the muscle was taking up more, the mitochondria were working better. But importantly, she even found that quality of life as measured by the SF36 actually went up. But as we expected, it went down to baseline in 14 weeks. So what about weight training in patients? And what we usually do is patients who are severely intolerant of endurance exercise, we usually start with weights, because a lot of them can tolerate it because it's more of an anaerobic type of activity. So it's a good way to titrate your patients in, but does it work? So this is again uh, Tanya Tavasalo's work uh, with another colleague of mine, Doug Turnbull, and they had patients who have single large-scale deletions. That's the CPO group, who usually have ptosis, which you probably can't see at the back, uh, hearing loss, and skeletal muscle weakness. So they did a pretty standard, uh, fairly high-intensity resistance exercise training program. And what they found was improvements in leg extension, double leg press, and again, no decline in CK. So I'm just going to finish with a couple of the other diseases that we see because I think there's similarities amongst all of them. So as I mentioned, we've studied aging a lot because it has uh, many of the similar phenotypic features to what we see in the clinic. And I think uh, with aging, uh, work by Sri Nair, who is here, um, he's gone now, uh, uh, Stu Phillips, myself, we've clearly shown benefits uh, to various types of exercise, both endurance and resistance, and even HIT in the aging group. I think uh, you know, Tanya's uh, great work and uh, the Danish group have shown improvements with the mitochondrial disease, but what about these other groups? There's strong evidence, as we heard from Vlad, that myotonic uh, dystrophy type 1 has mitochondrial impairment. FSH dystrophy and another thing called sporadic inclusion by body myopathy is exercise of benefit for these folks. And again, you know, we've heard this, I won't spend uh, much time going through it, but we had 11 patients who had myotonic dystrophy type 1. Uh, we did a pretty standard exercise program. And just from a, a practical perspective, it was interesting that we had one lady who came in, she had foot drop, and you know, she came into the clinic, got on the bike, and barely lasted a minute with essentially just spinning the pedals. But at the end of it, everyone was exercising three times per week at 65% of VO2 peak for 35 minutes. And then, uh, again, this is Andrew's uh, amazing work, and I know you've seen some of this. I'm just showing some uh, graphs that Vlad didn't show, just to show that at the transcriptom transcriptomic level, uh, using RNA-seq, we showed that there was mitochondrial uh, dysfunction, which uh, improved. 
we showed at the protein level, uh, the impairment across the respiratory chain and the improvement after exercise. And then with high resolution respirometry, uh, we also showed the improvements as well. And you can see here histologically with SDH staining, showing the control DM1 pre and DM1 post. And you can see that it's not the sort of heteroplasmic um, sort of patchy loss that we see with aging, and it's not what we see in our patients with mitochondrial disease with the Cox negative uh, true fibers, but just a general reduction. So we've known that exercise can improve function, uh, function in myotonic muscular dystrophy uh, type 2 patients uh, based on observational data. And I think what uh, Andrew did is really showed this in a prospective manner because we'd published a paper years ago with Lauren Brady, who's my genetic counselor, that our patients who habitually exercise have slower decline in function. So we do have patients who continue to exercise. Unfortunately, none of the 11 in this study did, but in those who do, we did show a decline. Now, I think, you know, Vlad talked a lot about the molecular stuff, but what was interesting is that it was safe and it improved function. So we did a six-minute walk test, which is what the FDA loves for getting drugs approved. Uh, Pompe disease for myozyme, I saw someone shake their head. They understand that it costs about $900,000 a year. Does anyone know the increase in six-minute walk test? 27 meters. So the FDA and all across the world, people are using this drug for 27 meter improvement, and then people laugh at us who do exercise, oh, it's dirty science, and nutritional is dirty science. 47 meters improvement, also timed up and go, five times sit to stand, and a 30% increase in VO2 max. What was interesting is lean body mass went up, percent body fat didn't go down significantly, but when you look at the ratio between them, what we call the ripped ratio or body composition, composition index, dramatically improved. And this also works too, and I uh, thank Frank Booth, uh, who's uh, you know, really been a mentor of mine, uh, and I think has really taught all of us that exercise really is medicine. So uh, for a meeting that I went to just a few weeks ago, uh, we're doing the same analysis in FSH patients, and I told Aaron, my research coordinator, to go back in our FSH patients who show, because of a demethylation in the DUX4 region, oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction, does exercise help in the long run? in a practical uh, basis. So when our patients come in, we do biodex of the knee extension and arm flexion in all of our patients. And I tasked Aaron with going back and finding me the first 10 people who were exercising three times per week or more, where we had more than 10 years of data, and find me the first 10 people where we had 10 years of data who exercised one time per week or less. Does it actually make a difference? And you can see here that the folks with knee extension who exercised three times per week or more had a 3% decline and those who didn't had a 34% decline. And the same was true of arm flexion. And we study this because the knee extension is your biggest determinant of going into a wheelchair. Once that biodex knee extension crosses 10 Newton meters, 50% of people are in a wheelchair. So these changes over a long period of time have dramatic impacts on people's function. And again, one of the biggest canonical uh, final common pathways in this is mitochondrial dysfunction. So I'll thank my real students my excellent students, my honest students who've done all the work and have been with me for 35 years, not these guys, but many of you in the room have been with me for a uh, long time, my excellent clinic support and my outstanding and um, uh, lovely collaborators, including my wife um, who does all our pathology. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Very nice, Mark. Um, Mark. And it's great that you're you know, really committed to your patients. So I commend you on that and keep up the good work. Um, one of the things that we showed a few years ago um, <coughs> with Gordon Lynch in the context of, of dystrophy mm -hmm. is that um, if you activate heat shock protein 70, you can um, restore function through modifying of circa. Um, exercise is one way to do that, but um, heat therapy is another way. And there are actually a study, there's a study in New England that shows that hot tub therapy is good for type 2 diabetes because it activates heat shock proteins. Have you ever thought about like either like heat therapy for, for these kids? Yeah, no, I, I know uh, some of, uh, I, know, I know your work, and uh, there's uh, work that clearly shows that the HSP-72s uh, are certainly uh, beneficial, and there's some 
you know, small molecule <coughs> activators that I yes. know you've, you've worked on. Um, now, uh, we've not done it yet, but, you know, it's a reasonable thing. And it may be that uh, why exercise is so beautiful and so potent is that it's not just what's going on with AMP kinase, but yeah, yeah. it is heat, it is blood flow, it's oxygen, there's multifactorial. And I think that's why it's going to be impossible to ever have exercise in a pill. Yeah, I agree. But, I mean, it might be that, you know, it could be an adjunct because, because oh, sure. they would be exercise intolerant to some degree, so it might be like, a, like an adjunct therapy to maybe just raise it oh, up for a sure. little bit. Yeah, it'd be a great study if anyone wants to sponsor some saunas for our patients. It would be <laughs> lovely. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'm just wondering about the fibre type distribution. So when you had some of those, um, the improvements, do you know whether you get any fibre type shift because the type ones are probably less affected than the twos? Oh, you mean in the, in the myotonic study? Yeah, in the myotonic one. Yeah, Andrew, uh, you could speak to that. I don't think we had any fibre type shifts. Yeah, we had, a, 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 I think it was 0 0.051, which is why I know he didn't cook the books, because no grad student would give me that if they did for, fiber, for, for hypertrophy. So what we found is improvement in endurance, but we didn't get a hypertrophic response uh, in these patients. And so that's probably why we didn't see fiber type shifts. But there was a, a, a trend, strong trend towards an increase in, in all fiber types. I think it was across the board, too, from type 1 through to type 2, 2x. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thanks. It's a, it's a pleasure to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Beth Phillips from University of Nottingham. We're looking forward to your talk. Dr. Phillips, thanks. Thanks. Um, so I'd just like to also thank the organizers for the opportunity to present here today. Um, the typed program does say that I'm from McMaster. Um, I'm not, I had a much longer journey here, so um, I'm actually from the University of Nottingham um, in the UK. Um, my talk's going to be a little bit different to the two that we've heard from Vladimir and from Mark. Um, so I'm a translational physiologist, um, so um, the, the talk today is very much going to be about um, an intervention that we looked at the efficacy of first um, and then took some samples um, and some data sets back to the lab to try and understand the mechanistic impact of that. So uh, no animal studies and, and no heat maps, um, and I'm not sure if people will be pleased or sad about that. So, um, as the title of my talk suggested, um, I'm going to talk about a study that one of my surgical fellows conducted in octogenarians based around high-intensity interval training. Um, but before I moved on to the study specifics, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background, I guess, about how we arrived at that program of work. Um, so probably uh, talking to people who this isn't necessarily particularly new information for, but in terms of muscle mass maintenance, which Mark introduced really nicely in terms of its importance, um, the two key anabolic signals are contractile activity, so exercise largely, um, and nutritional intake, primarily in the form of protein as the driving macronutrient. Um, there is, however, limitations to this, um, and unfortunately, we can't just consume protein, no matter how high the quality of that protein is, and do some exercise and continue to grow. And this is largely attributed to something known as the muscle full phenomenon. So um, as you can see here on this graph, um, muscle protein synthesis um, is represented as the red line. Um, and you can see that approximately 120 to 150 minutes after feeding, even in the presence of contractile activity, that this returns to baseline despite a continued availability of amino acids and actually continued availability of some of the cell signaling pathways that we would most commonly associate with muscle protein synthesis or MPS. Um, we know that contractile activity can extend um, the duration and somewhat um, increase the amplitude of that response, but it's still switched off by seemingly intrinsic muscle processes, meaning that it isn't something that we can rely on to have finite growth or hypertrophic responses. Um, so my interests overall, or what my lab focus on, are looking at environmental interventions, so primarily exercise and nutrition, um, to improve the health span of older adults. Um, and when we think about our older adults, and again, something that Mark touched upon for us, they face a kind of a dual, a dual challenge, I guess, in that that muscle fall phenomena is something that is still represented in our older adults, but they also have anabolic resistance, in that they don't mount the same anabolic responses to a feeding and or 
nutritional, uh, sorry, uh, nutritional and or exercise stimuli as our younger individuals. Um, and again, if you look here, you can see here that for feeding alone, this would be our young individuals, um, and then our older individuals aren't able to mount the same anabolic response. And this is also true when we combine nutrition and, in this case, a single bout of resistance exercise training. Um, this was work from Matt Brook, who was one of the PhD students in our lab at the time. Um, not so much the focus of this talk today, because I am going to be talking to you about a non-specific clinical cohort, um, but you can see that on the slide here on the left, or the, the uh, diagrammatic on the left here, you can see that this anabolic resistance is actually exacerbated in a number of chronic conditions, and many of those conditions are age-associated. So given the aging population that we have across the, the Western world, it's something that we really need to be mindful of when we're trying to achieve muscle mass maintenance to then achieve health span in these older adults. Um, again, we've had a couple of sessions across this wonderful uh, meeting that have talked about sarcopenia, the importance of muscle mass maintenance and actually aging muscle. Um, and certainly the cancer session this morning um, did a really good job of highlighting um, a lot of these factors. Um, so I just wanted to touch upon this really briefly in that you can see based on the trajectory of decline that we get from approximately the age of 40, you can see that if the tra trajectory of decline is steeper, then the age at which individuals fall below a disability threshold is much younger. And as we have an aging population, we need to try and move that away so that we have people living independently, healthy, high quality of life lives for as long as possible. Um, the data on the right-hand side um, of the slide there shows data from the Il Sorrente study in Italy. Um, and this shows really nicely, actually, this study, that muscle mass predicts physical function, quality of life, and as shown on the graph there, mortality in over 80s over a four-year period. So what you can see is this, this star here represents those in the lowest turtle for muscle mass maintenance over the four-year period, and their survival rate is significantly lower than those in both of the other two groups. Um, so as I said, I'm not going to focus on a specific clinical cohort today, um, but quite a lot of the work that comes out of my lab, lab is based around prehabilitation for cancer patients. Um, and again, cancer largely dependent upon the tumor site is an age-associated condition. So I just wanted to give a really brief kind of touch here upon the additional importance perhaps of muscle mass maintenance for older patients facing hospitalization and or additional physiological insults such as treatment perhaps in the form of surgery. Um, so the data at the top is just um, observational data from a study coming out of Geneva, um, and they found that low muscle mass um, for both medical and surgical admissions was associated with hospitalization in the first place, um, an increased length of stay, and worse hospital outcomes in terms of complications and survival. And then on the bottom here, what you can see is actually data that somewhat replicates that from the Il Sorrente study. So that was in healthy old adults, whereas this is in surgical cancer patients with spinal cancer. Um, and you can see again that in the three years following surgery, um, you can find that those with the highest degree of muscle mass maintenance had the best survival outcomes. So muscle mass maintenance really is important for our older adults, both those who are community dwelling and seemingly otherwise fit and well and our older patient cohorts. So hopefully that's everyone convinced that muscle mass maintenance is, is really important and it's something that we need to focus on. Um, but another factor, um, and again, Mark touched upon it, in that we do have known cutoffs for cardiorespiratory fitness that do predict, predict either surgical outcomes or disability or independent living, is that of cardiorespiratory fitness, which clearly in terms of physiological um, uh, association is very much linked to skeletal muscle mass and this was work from our group a number of years ago in colorectal cancer patients actually showing this relationship between lean muscle mass and cardiorespiratory fitness but this has been portrayed across the literature in numerous healthy cohorts and indeed in clinical cohorts um, both young and older adults. Um, what we've also found, again, in relation to our clinical older adults, is that cardiorespiratory fitness predicts both mortality and length of stay after major elective surgery in older adults. Um, and a study that we did, I guess, again, more looking at quality of life and perhaps even care cost burden, um, was looking at return to work. So we were, of course, looking at younger older adults, so middle-aged through to older adults. Um, and those adults who were working before they presented for colorectal cancer 
surgery, only one third of them returned to work after their surgery, and this was directly related to their cardiorespiratory fitness at the time of operation. So um, we know that we need to improve cardiorespiratory fitness. We, need to, we know that we want to either try and maintain or perhaps, um, maybe a bit of a long shot, but increase skeletal muscle mass. Um, and again, given the audience here, surely the answer is just do some exercise. Um, and that seems really simplistic, but when we think about the limitations to everyone in terms of perhaps time and people's want to do exercise, but perhaps more importantly in terms of the distinct physiological adaptations that are offered by the two most traditional forms of exercise training, so resistance exercise training primarily being associated with hypertrophy and muscle function, and then endurance or aerobic exercise training primarily being associated with those physiological features associated with improvements in cardiorespiratory fitness, so those related to the mitochondria, which we've heard about already in this session and this, over this meeting, but things like angiogenesis as well, people would need to be doing both to arguably achieve the benefits that we feel are really important to have optimal health span in our older adults. Um, high intensity interval training has emerged in the literature um, as a potential exercise modality that can perhaps increase both of those aspects of physiology and obviously in a time efficient manner. So when we think about our resistance exercise training and our endurance exercise training, um, quite often the session durations are quite long, but also the actual time requirement that's needed for a training regime to elicit a positive impact is quite long. Um, and for some individuals or for some patient groups, that wouldn't be a problem. Um, but as I said, a lot of my work is in cancer prehabilitation. And certainly in the UK, the National Cancer Action Team dictates that we only have 31 days between decision to treat and curative surgery. So any intervention that we want to put in place has to be effective within that 31 day window. Um, I don't have time to go over kind of the body of work that you can see there in the bullet points, um, but this is some of the work that's come out of my lab in the last couple of years using the same high intensity interval training protocol that I'm going to present to you for the remainder of this talk. Um, so we do 90 seconds of unloaded cycling, then we do five 60 second high intensity exertions interspersed with 90 seconds recovery between each, um, and then a two and a half minute unloaded cycling period at the end of each session. Um, HIT obviously is often used as an umbrella term for anything that has these periods of high intensity followed by recovery um, or um, complete rest, um, but this is our protocol. One of the reasons we choose to use this protocol um, is because from a public health stance, it's a 15 minute session. Um, so in terms of being able to try and sell it um, to our patient populations or, or to our volunteer cohorts, that seems achievable and it seems manageable. And I think we were quite surprised when we first moved into certainly our older adults and then into our patient populations is that we thought the lack of time issue would very much be around working hours and young individuals and families, but actually our older individuals have really busy lives um, and then you pair that with um, a clinical insult, so something like cancer that involves lots of meetings, lots of treatments, um, lots of hospital visits already, and lack of time is still something that we kind of found was really a prohibitive factor for putting an intervention in place place. So we did this body of work, um, so we looked at this high intensity interval training program in individuals with heightened metabolic risk, healthy older adults, we've done it in colorectal cancer patients, urological cancer patients, and um, the joys of COVID led us to look at it as a home-based equipment-free intervention as well. Um, but even after all of that work had been conducted, we still felt that the question needed to be answered about the efficacy and mechanism of this high intensity interval training regime for inducing favorable physiological adaptations in what we call very old adults with disease. Um, I think we, we do it, uh, most labs do it. I think sometimes it's um, from an ethical or a safety perspective. Sometimes it's from trying to get a relatively homogeneous population of participants. Um, we quite often study older adults who are 65. Well, I think, you know, as the world's moving on, as the population's aging, they're not maybe the people that we need to be concentrating on. Um, I also think when we exclude anyone who has type 2 diabetes, hypertension, all of those common systemic age-associated conditions, we're perhaps not doing work that's truly representative of the population that we need to be intervening. 
We're not, of course, the first lab to look at the mechanisms of how high-intensity interval training could potentially induce favourable adaptations related to cardiorespiratory fitness and or skeletal muscle mass. Um, and so I just wanted to give you a bit of a snapshot of some of the work that, you know, allowed us to get to the question um, and then we've hopefully built upon from that. So um, this was work that was actually a collaborative effort between uh, the Chinese Institute of Sports Science and the University of Zagreb um, in a pre-clinical model. Um, and they compared moderate intensity continuous training or aerobic exercise training for all intents and purposes to high intensity interval training. Um, and what they found was that only high intensity interval training was able to improve VO2 max um, at both four weeks and eight weeks. Um, and then similarly, I guess, moving over to the, the muscle mass side of, of our two things that we're looking at, um, it was also only high intensity interval training that was able to elicit favorable adaptations in both anabolic and catabolic cell signaling. There has been human work, um, and this work was from Stu Phillips's lab, um, and they, com again, compared aerobic exercise training and high-intensity interval training um, with an additional comparison of looking at resistance exercise training. Um, and what Kirsten Bell found uh, was that when they looked at myofibrillar FSR, both re resistance exercise training and high-intensity interval training was able to uh, cause an increase in myofibrillar fractional synthetic rate for up to two days after the exercise training. So this was an acute exercise by, of those three different types, whereas only high-intensity interval training was able to cause an increase in the sarcoplasmic fraction. Um, and just to point out, this is in older men, so very much related to kind of where we were looking to be interested in as we took this work forward. Um, some more human work here. So um, the graph on the bottom right here, um, this shows work from the University of Florida, whereby uh, not related to high intensity interval training, but Joseph et al. did find um, that when they compared high functioning elders or older adults to low functioning older adults, it definitely seemed to be that mitochondrial dysfunction was a commonality that um, explained the dissociation between those two groups. Um, and then moving back to high intensity interval training, um, work from Steen Larsen's group um, in Copenhagen in both young and older adults found that high intensity interval training using the exact protocol that we also use was able to increase uh, citrate synthase activity in both young and older men and women. Um, they also saw increases in maximum mitochondrial respiration, but interestingly, no increase in what they referred to as the intrinsic respiratory capacity. So when uh, the maximum mitochondrial respiration was corrected for citrate synthase activity, they didn't see that, perhaps suggestive that the increases that they saw were actually related to increases in mitochondrial content. So, um, on the background of all, of all that work, um, and on the background of this, which was our feasibility study that um, Kat Boraboom, one of my surgical fellows, completed prior to doing some of the cancer studies, um, whereby we were able to see that our specific HIP protocol was able to elicit improvements in cardiorespiratory fitness and markers of muscle mass, we moved on to the study that I'm going to talk to you about for the last section of my talk now. Um, so here you can see the study design and the participant characteristics um, for our study. So uh, they had a mean age of 81, males and females. Um, you can see that their comorbidities are listed there and they were all classified as ASA grade two or three. So they all had some degree of systemic disease. Uh, we used a run-in control period um, primarily to help with recruitment efforts. So participants underwent a four-week control period, then had a four-week intervention period. Um, and they were studied obviously at week zero, at week four, and at week eight. Um, in addition to acute study day assessments where we looked at cardiorespiratory fitness and muscle function um, and, and took mu muscle biopsies to look at anabolic and catabolic cell signaling, um, we also gave our participants a bolus of D2O, um, deuterated water, at the start of the study um, and then gave them weekly top-ups so that we could look at the rates of muscle protein synthesis over these four week periods. Um, for those of you who don't necessarily do work looking at muscle protein synthesis, um, one of the big benefits of the deuterated water technique is that you can look at it in a free living environment. Um, so compared to traditional tracer techniques, perhaps where you can only look at a maximum of 24 hours due to the need for a continuous IV infusion, what this technique allows us to do is actually look at FSR or muscle protein synthesis 
over the four-week control period compared to the four-week high-intensity interval training period. So what's really happening to those individuals during these different phases? Um, just a quick note, the adherence to the high-intensity interval training was really good, so people were asked to complete 12 sessions, so three sessions a week over the four-week period, um, and we had um, an average of 11 and a half sessions completed, um, and the compliance in terms of compliance to the intensity requirements for the high-intensity interval training was also really favourable. So what did we see with this study? Um, so we saw, um, I guess maybe as expected, but certainly what we were pleased to see was that this uh, high intensity interval training program was able to elicit improvements in cardiorespiratory fitness in our octogenarians with the disease. We were also able to improve exercise tolerance um, and we were also able to improve their total fat mass. And this was also represented um, as leg, uh, total fat mass, total lean mass, sorry. Um, and this was also represented um, when we looked at the legs as a region of interest. And again, as Mark said, they're definitely our functionally important muscle group that we need to be, make sure that these people can live independent, healthy lives. Um, not necessarily related to the primary endpoints of the study, um, but we also saw reductions in resting heart rate and mean arterial pressure. So again, eliciting, I guess, favorable changes in terms of the physiological resilience of these older adults. Um, and we also saw reductions in both total fat mass and body fat percentage. So a little bit about the mechanistic basis or what we are perhaps um, starting to explore now um, is we looked at these muscle protein synthesis uh, rates during the control period and the high intensity interval training period. And as you can see, we had significant improvements uh, in the myofibrillar FSR uh, when we compared our hit period to our control period. And interestingly, when we performed correlative analysis, it actually seemed that there was a significant correlation between these changes in FSR and the changes in fat-free mass that we saw. Um, and this was replicated when we looked at absolute synthetic rates as well. So when we looked at our FSR multiplied by our fat-free mass. I feel like I might be running out of time. Um, so, <laughs> um, no, I'm okay. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so just to show you the uh, signaling data um, from this study, um, quite often in, in the literature, in the human literature, we see that there's actually quite a lot of discordance between what we see maybe with Western blotting, looking at standard cell signaling pathways um, and our physiological endpoints. But actually for this study, um, in keeping with our changes in FSR or fractional synthetic rate, uh, we did see increases in our anabolic cell signaling but no change in our catabolic cell signaling. So perhaps suggestive that actually the high intensity interval training protocol isn't um, augmenting muscle protein breakdown. Um, and that's something we definitely want to move forward with. Um, and for anyone who's interested, we've just published some papers on um, a method known as the COSIAM method. Um, so combined stabilized safe assessment of muscle um, and just using oral traces that allows us to look at muscle protein synthesis, muscle protein breakdown, and muscle mass with a single tracer drink and a single biopsy. Um, and that's work by Jessica Chigelski and Dan Wilkinson from our lab. So um, we also looked at um, perhaps some things that could be underlying or could be our mechanistic basis for the hit induced improvements in cardiorespiratory fitness. Um, annoyingly, sadly, maybe, um, at this time we didn't have the Ouroboros set up in our, lab, in our lab and that's something, again, that we want to move forward to so that we can actually make functional measures related to the mitochondria. Um, but we were able to see increases in mitochondrial content in terms of uh, citrate synthase and also in terms of mitochondrial capacity. And this was true for the majority of the complexes and it just for, I guess, graphical presentation, what you can see there is our complex three work. Um, similar actually to what we saw with the change in fat-free mass and the change in muscle protein synthesis, again there is a correlation when we look at our change in uh, mitochondrial complex representation by Western blotting and our change in cardiorespiratory fitness. So in summary, um, I think everyone's hopefully convinced that we should be working towards trying to uh, improve and or maintain cardiorespiratory fitness uh, and muscle mass and of course function um, in our older adults um, and that this form of HIT can be safely delivered to octogenarians with disease. 
Um, importantly, it can be safely de delivered, but it also appears to be effective at improving body composition, largely from a perspective of muscle mass maintenance and cardiorespiratory fitness. Um, it appears that upregulation of this cumulative muscle protein synthesis appears to underlie the HIT-induced hypertrophy, um, and perhaps, although more work is needed, mitochondrial capacity changes seemingly at least partly underlie the changes in cardiorespiratory fitness. Um, the future work that we've either started or have planned um, is a larger scale rollout to look at kind of public health benefit in a more diverse cohort and just a larger sample size, and also to carry on looking at the efficacy of this intervention as pre and rehabilitation for clinical insults that our older adults face. Um, we'd also like to utilize some of the mechanistic knowledge that's been derived from this study to develop optimized and or adjuvant interventions. And Mark touched upon perhaps the potential of nutraceuticals, so maybe things like um, NAD precursor supplementation to further improve, improve the mitochondrial aspects um, of our older adults. Um, and with that, I would just like to acknowledge all of the other PIs in our center, um, our technical support, uh, James, Kat, and Nima did almost all of the work that I've presented today. Um, and of course, um, for any human research, the most important people are our research participants. And for them, we have massive thanks at all times. Thank you. Hi, Beth. Great, great talk. Thanks very much. Um, we've talked a little bit about this, and I know you're probably aware, but uh, we just published a couple of papers, Maureen and I, showing that now we can get the same adaptations in these moderate intensity constraints. These were heart-treated patients um, using stair climbing. So it, it, we're getting to the point now where this minimum dose of HIT needed to you know, budge the needle on some of these people, uh, the barriers are beginning to fall away. So you don't need a bike. You don't need anything. You can just sort of, I don't want to say run, but ascend the stairs as rapidly as you can. Mm -hmm. And in 12 weeks of people being on their own and doing it, they're pretty adherent. So, I mean, how low can we go with these patients? Because it's really, we're, we're talking about the minimum dose and to the point that Mark made about a VO2 of about 17 mils per kilo Below that, you're considered functionally disabled. But you, you can't ascend, descend flights of stairs, and so you're, so how low can we go? Yeah, um, I think that's a really good question. Um, I think I alluded to it, but perhaps I spoke too fast because that's what I have a tendency to do. Um, but um, I think um, I have obviously seen the work from, from you and Maureen. Um, I think the problem for us, or the consideration for us, is like I said, all of our interventions, even in these adults who aren't yet facing a uh, clinical treatment insult is that we need to fit within those action team times, so four weeks. So I think th there's probably two different questions in terms of how low can we go for effectively a lifestyle intervention that's, that's longer in duration, um, and how low can we go when we only have a time-limited window. Um, we have actually just had work accepted into Age and Aging, which is looking at the, the COVID-induced um, home-based home protocol. And so we used the same five-by-one-minute protocol, um, but of course it wasn't directed in a laboratory, and so intensity arguably was probably slightly lower, but that was body weight-based exercises that simply included things like, you said, stepping, um, some form of modified star jump, but they were very, you know, they weren't kind of loader intense um, exertions. And so I definitely think there is scope to move it further. I think especially in our adults who are, are certainly are much older adults who are perhaps, perhaps already, you know, below physiological optimum, I think we can go lower to take them up and then perhaps introduce them to a higher stimulus to see where we can take them after that. Is the anabolic resistance phenomenon, is it present in these individuals with this uh, protocol of training? Uh, so, yeah, so in terms of, um, I, I didn't have time to present it, but in terms of anabolic resistance to exercise over the longer term, um, there's not been as much work on that because of the fact that the deuterated water technique is relatively new. Um, looking just at, at, at two independent data sets from our lab, so not doing a, you know, a, a controlled comparison of a study, um, these individuals actually seem to have retained all of their adaptive capacity, certainly compared to younger, older adults, so our 65-year-olds, 
and probably not that different to our young adults. Um, for anyone who was in the, the session next door this morning, um, just of note, what's really interesting is our colorectal cancer patients have fully blunted responsiveness um, to this exact same protocol, whereas our prostate cancer patients were able to mount the response that we see in their age-matched non-cancer controls. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Phillips. I'm very pleased to introduce our, our final speaker of this session, um, Dr. Emmerich Raval Shapui from the University of Ottawa. Emmerich's going to be discussing data on myotonic dystrophy type 1 and, um, and exercise. Thank you, Emmerich. Hi, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present our work today. So uh, our work is on uh, AMPK on its potential as a therapeutic target for uh, myotonic dystrophy type 1 or DM1. So uh, Vlad did a, a, a great introduction earlier, so uh, I'll go quickly uh, on the background on, on DM1. So worldwide, the prevalence of DM1 is around uh, 1 in 8,000 to 1 in 20,000. So it can be considered as a rare disorder. But in certain regions of the world, like in Canada, in the eastern part, in the saguenay lac saint jean area, the prevalence can be very, very high, around 1 in 600. So as you can see, it's not a rare disorder in, in, this, uh, in this region. Uh, the clinical features of DM1 uh, uh, that it's a, it's a neuromuscular disorder. Um, the main characteristics are muscle pain, muscle weakness, muscle wasting. Another characteristic is the myotonia, which is an, an hyperexcitability of muscle fibers. So when the muscles contract, they have difficulty to relax after contraction. And it's due to a mutation in chloride channel. And I will come back to that later. But in addition to being a neuromuscular disorder, it's also a multisystemic disorder. So we have uh, the muscle component of the disease, but it affects as well the GI tract, the cardiovascular system with cardiac conduction defects, uh, cognitive dysfunctions, um, endocrine system with uh, insulin resistance, and so on, and so on. So it's a very variable uh, disease with uh, a multisystemic uh, component. At uh, uh, the genetic level, uh, the mutation has been mapped in the uh, DMPK gene, so it's a CTG expansion. But in fact, what's very striking is that the mutation is not in the coding sequence of the gene. It will end up in the uh, three parameter of the mRNA. So uh, here, the CTG expansion becomes a CUG expansion. Unaffected, uh, uh, unaffected individuals have between 5 and 37 repeats when you start developing symptoms when you reach a threshold of 50 and plus. And the more repeats you have, uh, the more severe the symptoms will be, and um, the earlier the symptoms will appear. So you have the congenital forms of the disease when you reach several thousands of repeats. So uh, what does it do? Uh, so the CUG expansion forms a hairpin a structure like that on, on, on this schematic. And the direct consequence of this help information is that the mRNA will aggregate in the nucleus of uh, DM1 cell. So here you have an example of an in situ hybridization with a myonuclei, in, sorry, a nuclei nucleus uh, stained in blue with DAPI. And you can see these spots here uh, that are uh, highlighted by the probe uh, in, in the nucleus. So they are aggregates of uh, uh, CUG containing mRNA. The direct consequence of this health information is that it will create an unbalance in the homeostasis of many, many RNA binding proteins. The most famous one is MBNL1, or muscle blind lac protein 1. It interacts with the CUG repeat, so it will uh, uh, be sequestered with the, um, the, the aggregated mRNA. So the CUG expansion acts as a sponge and will uh, sequester this uh, MBNL1. So it's not available in the rest of the cell to do its job. 
Uh, another one is self one, which is uh, increased, so it's an opposite uh, uh, regulation. Um, past work from our lab has shown that Staffen one was increased and is involved in the mechanism of, uh, of DM1, and we spend a lot of time looking at the role of Staffen one in the disease and as well in norm, uh, normal muscle, and we found that it, it regulates attentate splicing, cellular stress, myogenesis, and muscle atrophy. So what they have in common is that they're all uh, splicing factors. So when we misregulate uh, their um, localization or uh, level, it will affect alter alternative splicing. So this is a short list of a few uh, examples of a few mRNA that are misregulated in DM1. But now with RNA-seq, we can uh, uh, have a list of several hundreds, several thousands of uh, mRNA that are being aberrantly regulated in DM1. A few of them have been well characterized and been directly linked to the symptoms of the disease. Uh, for example, uh, a misplacing of uh, insulin receptor with the skipping of one exon uh, has been linked to the insulin resistance that is seen in the pathology. At the opposite, when you have inclusion of this uh, exon containing a stop codon, uh, you have uh, expression of a non-functional protein uh, or a protein with different properties and it, uh, it causes myotonia. The, the, the aberrant alternative splicing of SCN5A has been linked to cardiac conduction defects on the skipping of, of two exons in uh, SARCA1 and RIDIN receptors uh, have been shown to be linked to uh, calcium homeostasis. And I will come back to these two uh, later in my presentation. So just to summarize this uh, mechanism that has been called RNA toxicity is that you have a, a COG expansion in the through prime UTR of uh, DMPK the mRNA will aggregate in the nucleus uh, of DM1 cells. It will create an unbalance in RNA binding proteins. For example, muscle blind is, uh, is decreased by sequestration with uh, RNA foci, and you have increase of other RNA binding proteins such as self one and staph one It will affect uh, uh, alternative splicing, and you have aberrant alternative splicing in the, in the pathology. On, uh, the, the model is that this aberrant alternative splicing will cause the main symptoms of the disease. In the early 2000s, the lab of Charles Taunton has developed a, a great mouse model. So uh, they had the great idea of using a normal transgene, so it's human skeletal actin, or HSA, and they fused in the three parameter of, uh, of this gene either five CUG repeats or 250 CUG repeats. So you have two mice, the short repeat or long repeat uh, mouse. And what they observed is that these mice developed all the key characteristics of the, the RNA toxicity mechanism. So you have RNA aggregation, aberrant regulation of uh, RNA binding proteins, aberrant alternative splicing. So it was really a proof of concept of this RNA toxicity mechanism. And it's also a great uh, mouse model for, to study the, the disease. In addition to uh, triggering this RNA uh, toxicity mechanism, um, the uh, expression uh, of the COG containing mRNA will create an imbalance in uh, several signaling pathways. Over the years, a few signaling pathways have been uh, characterized, such as PKC and GSK3 beta. On day one of the conference, we had a, a talk on GSK3 beta, and um, uh, over the years, it has been shown that uh, if you inhibit GSK3 beta with lithium chloride, or Tdeglusib, you can uh, improve the disease uh, phenotype. So we became interested in signaling pathways that were misregulated in DM1. Uh, Passwords from the lab has shown that uh, calcium, calcineurin, and fat signaling uh, was uh, increased in DM1. Um, and we, we believe that it's a, um, a compensatory mechanism because when we inhibit calcineurin, we are, the, the, the phenotype is worst uh, in mice. Uh, next week, we uh, looked at MPK signaling. So I, I would like to mention that uh, uh, there's still no cure for DM1. Uh, there, there are a few attempts to try to correct the RNA toxicity mechanism, for example, with uh, ant oligo antisense nucleotides. But so far, uh, uh, there's still no cure. So uh, finding novel uh, signaling pathways that are misregulated in the disease could uh, represent uh, novel strategies for, for, for the disease. And a good example is Tdeglusib on GSK3 beta. So we looked at uh, MPK, so uh, 
don't really uh, need this slide today, but I just want uh, to point uh, that uh, there are three subunits, and uh, AMP, AMP will bind to the gamma, gamma subunit, and there is a phosphorylation of the alpha subunit by upstream kinases. So we looked at MPK signaling in these DM1 mice, so the HSA-LR mice for long repeats. Uh, looking at total MPK levels, uh, we didn't see any uh, difference in the uh, total expression of MPK. However, what you can see uh, here on this panel is that there is a lower uh, phosphorylation status of MPK in, in muscle tissues. Accordingly, there is a decrease in PGC1 alpha expression in these uh, tissues. So it seems like there is a repression of MPK signaling uh, in, in DM1 tissue. We confirmed this result uh, using patient-derived DM1 myoblasts in culture. So here you see again that MPK signaling, uh, sorry, total MPK levels remain unchanged in DM1, uh, DM1 cells. However, phospho-MPK is decreased. So when you do the ratio, you can see that uh, there is a um, a lower phosphorylation status, a lower activation of MPK in, in these cells. So we're happy to see that uh, recently uh, in, the, uh, um, in the clinical trial, uh, they observed as well using uh, DM1 biopsies that the status of MPK phosphorylation was lower uh, in um, biopsies from DM1 patients. So we thought that maybe we could uh, reactivate uh, these signaling pathways in, in DM1 mice and maybe we would see a, be a beneficial effect uh, on the disease phenotype. So there are different ways to activate uh, MPK. Uh, we can use MPK mimetics such as ICAR, it's been wide, widely used uh, in the literature. Uh, you can use uh, other indirect activators such as metformin or resveratrol. And now there are novel uh, allosteric activators, such as uh, the Merck uh, MK8722991 or PF739. And exercise as well is a good way to, to activate uh, NPK. So I just want to uh, stop uh, just a minute to say that uh, in the Jasmine lab, we've been uh, interested a lot uh, 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 with um, uh, NPK activators, and we've used ICAR, metformin, and resveratrol as a way to uh, activate MPK, uh, especially for the, the for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, and as well uh, through combinatorial approaches. And we've shown in the past that uh, activating MPK will trigger muscle plasticity, which improves the disease, uh, the dystrophic phenotype of MDX mice, which is the, the most model for DMD. So uh, going back to the DM1 um, um, story, we uh, treated DM1 mice with ICAR for six weeks. Um, um, we looked at uh, several aspects of uh, muscle uh, histology. So um, we observed the expected activation of the signaling pathway with the shift toward the slow oxidative metabolism. We also observed histological improvements at the level of uh, uh, central nucleation, uh, cross-sectional area, and so on and so on. So we have a lot of uh, histological improvements associated with uh, six-week treatment with ICAR. And uh, we focused uh, our work uh, on the uh, RNA toxicity mechanism. Uh, so here on the left, you have uh, a, a fish, so a fluorescent in situ hybridization. So you have nuclei stained in blue with DAPI, and we used a, a, a red fluorescent probe. And you can see that uh, a few of these uh, nuclei um, um, are positive for, for, this, um, for this probe. So you can, it, it shows that myonuclei uh, have uh, accumulation of this uh, CUG containing mRNA in, in the nucleus. So we have around 40% of uh, uh, nuclei that contain uh, this type of RNA foci. Th these aggregates are called uh, RNA foci. But after six weeks uh, of treatment with uh, ICAR, we have a, sh a sharp reduction in the number of myonuclei containing uh, foci. We go from uh, or, uh, 35 to 40 percent to uh, around 15 percent of uh, positive nuclei. So we have a, a decrease in the number of, nucle um, of nuclei containing uh, RNA foci. Then we looked at muscle blind. So muscle blind is one of the RNA binding protein uh, which is misregulated in DM1. It, it will, it's sequestered with the, uh, uh, the CUG containing mRNA in the nucleus. And we, uh, again, we have the same type of regulation. We go from 40% uh, 
uh, nuclei containing uh, sequestered muscle blind to uh, around 20%. Then we uh, looked at alternative splicing regulation. So uh, here you have uh, a, co a couple of RT-PCR. So we, uh, we use primers flanking uh, the, the exon that is regulated by alternative splicing. So you have here the exon 22 of CIRCA1 and the exon 70 uh, of uh, ridin receptor. So uh, you have two isoforms be being produced, the uh, longer isoform containing the exon on the shorter isoform with the skipping or the exclusion of this exon. On the left here, you can see that control mice have mainly the long isoform of CERCA1 on a prevalent, pre uh, higher prevalence of the higher isoform of Rindin receptor 1. However, on DM1 mice, we have a completely different pattern. We have uh, now more exclusion, more skipping of, of these uh, uh, two exons. However, after six weeks of treatment, uh, here you can see on the right part of the, of the panel, you have a trend towards uh, an increase uh, uh, of uh, inclusion. So we go back to the control condition after six weeks of treatment. And we had the same uh, effect with uh, Randin receptor. We tried as well another uh, IMPK activator, which is uh, uh, resveratrol. So we saw the same trend with resveratrol, so a trend towards a, a rescue of alternative splicing patterns. However, the result was not uh, significant, which was to be expected because we know that resveratrol is not as potent as ICAR to, to activate uh, AMPK. So then, you know, it's, it's well known that uh, exercise elicit muscle plasticity through the activation of AMPK signaling. So we wondered whether endurance exercise could trigger the same beneficial effects as drug-induced AMPK activation. So uh, we placed a, a wheel uh, in the cage of these mice, and we let the wheel uh, for eight weeks. Uh, as you know, the mice can run for kilometers uh, every day, uh, so it's a, a good way to, to uh, do some exercise training um, for, for the mice. So again, uh, I will show you uh, some RT-PCR. So here we have the same two uh, targets, uh, CIRCA1 and Randin receptor. On the left, you have the control uh, pattern with more uh, inclusion of the exon, so you have the longer isoform being expressed. However, on DM1, again, we see that we have more of the lower isoform, the shorter isoform with the skipped uh, exon. And you can see on the right part of the gel, you have more inclusion. So we rescue partially uh, the, the splicing patterns uh, towards uh, control wild type levels. So on here, you have the in, uh, individual mice uh, with the different uh, ratios. So uh, to summarize uh, so uh, the, the story so far, uh, using AMPK activators such as ICAR and resveratrol, we activate uh, AMPK and we have histological improvements on improvement uh, inhibition of the RNA toxicity with the reduction of RNA foci formation, a correction of RNA binding protein uh, misregulation and correction of uh, aberrant alternative splicing. With exer exercise, we recapitulate the same type of improvement. So we, we next, but as you can see, it's not a full rescue, right? There's still room for improvement. So we wondered whether we could combine MPK activators on exercise to uh, have a, a better activation of MPK and hopefully have a better um, um, uh, rescue of the phenotype. So this is a story uh, by um, our PhD student. Um, so uh, we split the, the mice in four groups, uh, a sedentary group, a group treated with ICA, an exercise group, and a combinatorial group. Uh, she chose to, to do a, a different way uh, to, uh, for the, the training. Instead of do, uh, placing a wheel in the cage, we did uh, a swimming exercise. Uh, it's a shorter duration compared to uh, the, the wheel uh, running uh, ex uh, training that we did uh, previously. So this time it's only uh, four weeks, and we did two training per day. So it's one in the morning, one in the afternoon, half an hour uh, each time, and uh, five, five days a week. So the mice were exercised uh, five days a week, and they were e either, either injected with saline or with ICAR. And uh, we had the expected effect uh, on um, 
the fiber type switch, uh, the switch toward the slow oxidative metabolism, uh, increase in OXFOS, and so on and so on. And how today we'll focus on the uh, RNA toxicity. So here again, it's, it's an in-situ hybridization. Uh, on the left, you have the control mice. Uh, on, with the cross-section, you see the, the nuclei uh, stained with DAPI. And you can't really see at this magnification the, the red staining uh, with the, 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 the fish, for, with the probe, uh, sorry, the red probe. So I've put some arrows to point to the myonuclei that, that are co-stained with, with the probe. So um, here you have the exercised uh, condition. So you can see that we didn't obtain the same effect as we had before uh, with uh, the, the running exercise. But keep in mind that it was a shorter duration. Um, uh, it, the first story we did was eight weeks of running. This time it's only four weeks. Uh, the duration of the, of the exercise is different. The mice, when they run, they can run for kilometers every day. Here's just two sessions of half an hour. So no effect on alternatives, on, oh, sorry, on uh, uh, RNA sequestration. With ICAR, with the shorter treatment, we observed, uh, we still observed the, the benef uh, beneficial effect. So it's a significant reduction in the uh, number of uh, nuclei um, that are positive for uh, RNA foci. However, the great uh, uh, result from this story is that when you combine both ICAR and exercise, you have a combinatorial effect. So the, it seems that the exercise potentiates uh, the positive impact of ICAR on RNA aggregation. We have the, exactly the same pattern when uh, we look at uh, muscle blind uh, sequestration. So same trend. So we reduce the, the foci, so the RNA aggregation, and we reduce the sequestration of muscle blind. Again, looking at alternative splicing patterns. So now you're familiar with this kind of uh, RT-PCR. On the left, we have the control pattern with uh, the longer isoform uh, being expressed. In DM1 condition, you have more of the uh, lower isoform with skipping of, of exon 22 on exon 70. And you can see uh, that there is a trend towards uh, a rescue um, of the uh, profiles towards uh, wild type ratios. Uh, again, uh, you can see here, you can appreciate that uh, a combining exercise and ICAR, we have a better rescue of alternative splicing. So uh, to summarize uh, uh, what we've obtained, um, uh, NPK activation uh, is beneficial for DM1, at least in, in this uh, preclinical mouse model, both the drug-based activation and the exercise-based uh, activation. Uh, we are happy to see that there were a couple of clinical trials that came out over the past few years, one with uh, metformin and one with aer aerobic exercise, and both have shown positive outcomes uh, for DM1 patients. Uh, and the a new uh, an, uh, result is that when we uh, use um, NPK activators on, uh, in combination with exercise, uh, we potentiate the effect of the drug-based activation. On globally, our work on DMD and DM1 shows the therapeutic potential of activating NPK signaling for uh, neuromuscular disorders. So there's still uh, some unknown, uh, um, uh, unanswered questions. For example, we don't know the true implication of NPK in this phenomenon. For example, uh, we've used uh, ICAR. Uh, it's, there's some, some NPK-independent effect of ICAR. Um, we've used resveratrol, which is uh, an indirect activator. Uh, the clinical trial with metformin, as you know, metformin activates NPK, but it has also some NPK-independent effect. So we should really uh, make sure that the effect we observe are going through NPK. So there are different ways to, to do that. We can use uh, the more direct uh, allosteric activators, such as the Merck uh, MK2722, 991, or PF739. We can use uh, genetic approaches and make uh, MPK uh, defi deficient, uh, DM1 MPK defic deficient mi mice, and so on. Um, the mechanism mediating the beneficial effect of MPK activation is still unknown. So there are a few uh, potential uh, candidates. 
uh, that have been uh, described in the literature that respond to MPK uh, for, uh, activation. So there are a couple of RNA binding proteins that would be regulated by MPK activation, and they can explain why we have some correction in, in splicing. But we still need to, to show uh, that that's the case uh, in, in DM1. The work that has been done with uh, um, uh, preclinical models have used only the HSA LR mouse model, which it, it's a great model. It's widely used, but it's, it's very a model that is, can be used for the RNA toxicity. And there are other mouse models that are available, and they have, the, the, for example, the old DMPK locus. So we might see different types uh, of regulation, and it can help us understand uh, how uh, all of this works. Finally, um, um, it would be great to understand the impact uh, of, of, of MPK on the MPK activation on other affected tissues. Re, uh, to look back to, to my first slide where I was showing that MPK is a multisystemic disorder. Here our work is only focusing on the muscle uh, component of the disease, but maybe using um, these MPK activators will be able to correct other uh, tissues on, on organ as well. So I will finish my presentation by acknowledging the people that were involved in this work. So of course, uh, Bernard Jasmine and other students of the lab, and as well as our collaborators and uh, our sponsors. Thank you. Emmerich, what do you think the uh, mechanism is for the potentiation of um combination, the combinatory effect. The, the mechanism for the potentiation when combining the two. Uh, yeah, approaches. so our hypothesis is that it will achieve a better activation of uh, MPK uh, because we can activate MPK by different ways. So maybe we have an increased activation of MPK. Uh, maybe uh, when we use uh, MPK activators in combination to exercise, we inc increase the, the blood flow. So maybe the drug will reach the, mu the muscle better. It can be another, another explanation to, to this uh, combinatorial effect. Um, we don't know. <laughs> Still a work in progress. Hi, Gilles Gaspillou. Thank you for your talk. It was Thank very you. interesting. Uh, it might actually be a question for all the speakers that talked about DM1 this morning. But I see like the very nice effect of exercise uh, that seems to be uh, helping in this pathology, and now AMPK activators such as ACAR. Is there a place for act autophagy activation in the improvement that you see in these models? Do you think autophagy plays a role? We haven't looked at autophagy at all, but uh, MPK is a known regulator of autophagy for sure. Don't, so that's something we need to, to, to look at. Okay. But personally, we haven't looked at autophagy. Thank you. Thank you. Just to mention, I was also a bit biased in my question, is because we accessed recently samples from DM1 patients, and we see some LC3B2 accumulation potentially, or at least changes in the LC3B1 to 2 ratio. So I was wondering if that could play a role or if you looked into it. Uh, but thank you for the answer. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. I have a more general question for pharmacological activation of AMP kinase. I mean, it's been tested and proposed in different uh, paradigms. For me, I mean, AMP kinase is a catabolic signal that activates catabolic pathways. So wouldn't you run into problems at some point, especially in a muscular dystrophy where you're already catabolic to a certain extent? Sure, that, that's a good point. Uh, I don't have any answer for you, so I'm sorry, but uh, it's been shown that using these MPK activators, you can have some beneficial effects. So I don't, so here we show directly on the RNA toxicity mechanism, but uh, for, for example, for Duchenne, you can have improvements linked to the shift toward the slow oxidative metabolism on muscle fibers will be more resistant. Um, so I, I understand that you will affect others things, right, but maybe by this shift towards low oxidative fibers, you can have compensate for, for this. Uh, no, it's I'm a balance, right? 
between good I see, and I mean, bad. There are all these positive effects that have been yeah. shown, but if you think about, I mean, a mouse and the patient, we also talk about different timelines that, you know, right. at some point this might shift towards detrimental uh, right. outcome. So maybe it's a question of dosage. Um, if the lower dose could prevent uh, reaching this threshold. Thank you. So, Thank you, Emmerich. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This brings our session to a close. Please uh, join me in um, uh, showing some appreciation for our speakers, Dr. Tarnopolsky, Dr. Phillips, and once again for Dr. Uh, Rabal Shabui. Enjoy your lunch. Uh, please come back for uh, the session this afternoon, and um, everyone have a safe trip home. After that, thank you.